grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Previously, we talked about the significance of devotion, how important it is, that it is indeed um, our, fom our foremost priority. Because in the devotion to God, we also gain understanding in the knowledge that God has provided to us. What he has revealed to us, we seek to understand. And that we see that this understanding can only come through grace. And that our salvation comes through grace by virtue of the faith that has been given to us. And to, again, to gain an additional understanding with regard to grace and salvation and faith itself. There's a fundamental question that we must ask ourselves for this irreversible understanding about grace and about our works. And that is, is the sacrificial work of Christ Jesus sufficient for all sin or not? If so, our works are of no use for salvation. If not, then we must ask if the works of Christ Jesus, plus our own works, are sufficient for all sin. In addition to the works of Emmanuel, the Messiah, and the Christ, how many additional works and of what quality are necessary on our part to gain sufficiency for sin? Do you suppose this is what Paul is informing us? Certainly not. Such an idea of a partial Messiah or that we are co-Messiahs in cooperation with the Son of God is heresy. The work of Christ Jesus is wholly sufficient and only in such understanding can we truly state that we are saved by works, just not by our works, but the works of Christ alone, sola Christo. For the work of obedience to the Father by the Christ is done on our behalf and is, and is the only righteous work. Our need for the Christ is evident enough by virtue of the law itself, for justice is also prescribed by the law, the wage of sin is death. Our complete helplessness becomes visible in understanding the knowledge unveiled through the Holy Scripture, for God chooses his own and has done so from before the very beginning, and this is the work of God, not of man. We humans cannot go to God as if it were our choice to, or decision to do so, unless or until God first comes to us. We have further confirmation of this divine election through Jesus' response to the disciples regarding the purpose of the parables. For it is not for everyone to know their meaning, but it is for his chosen or elect to know, and thus we must seek to know and to understand this wonderful gift of faith, which has been gifted to us for our salvation through God's grace alone. So in Matthew 13, So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I in the Father are one. That's John 10, verse 24 through 30. And this will help us also to understand what faith is as well. Can any of us believe God if we do not first believe in God? Certainly not. How can one believe that one doesn't, what one doesn't even believe in? But if we consider the con converse of that statement, can one believe in God and still not believe him? Certainly. Does Satan not believe in God? Do his minions not believe in God? Certainly they do. 
Satan went to Jesus with temptations, and evil spirits pleaded with, with Jesus to leave them alone, as they called Jesus by name, through their knowledge of him. We can make a valid claim, then, that faith is not simply believing in God, but actually believing God. For the difference is significant. We need only consider sin itself for further evidence of this. Because sin is significantly a characterization of a belief in God with actual, without actually believing God. Guilt and conscience are experiences and proof of this. Primarily, there must be a God to whom we sense a guilt for something we did or didn't do, for our conscience is addressing it through the experience of guilt. How could guilt or conscience exist without an immutable morality? Ergo, God. Hence, our sin is our rejection of God that our conscience acknowledges while our obedience to God serves as confirmation for believing God that our faith acknowledges. Then, by virtue of sin, can we make any claim that man is somehow good? Do you think that man is basically good, or is he basically evil, as in absent uh, basic goodness? Admittedly, I want to believe that man is fundamentally good, but I have trouble believing that it is actually true. As a major source for my doubt, I have my own life that has failed miserably and fails repeatedly. Also, I have an abundant supply of personal accounts by past clients that feature examples of the sinful nature and wickedness of man. These two references, along with the wickedness of leadership displayed and exposed throughout history of man, leave me skeptical at a minimum. Nonetheless, I notice how much I still want to believe in man's inherent goodness, because if I can delude myself enough, I might find some peace of mind and hope for man. But in the end, my rational mind points to its opposite conclusion, highlighting the notable and overwhelming evidence contrary to this preferable delusion. By the way, the very fact that we prefer to think man is basically good is a preference to reject God for ourselves and our efforts for corrections. Naturally, those who want to support their desirable beliefs in the basic good of man are unprepared to do so with any populous evidence, because like so many ideas and fantasies we hold dear, thoughtful considerations are given no serious attention. We simply apply our preference. As a result, we are easily swayed in the cunning of the wickedness. In other words, we want or prefer to believe in them or in man. The German people wanted to believe Hitler. The Russian people wanted to believe Stalin. The French people wanted to believe the beheadings of their nobles served the poor. And we want to believe corruption has ended in our own home. So I direct us to a different test, less catastrophic, so as not to frustrate ourselves too much. If man were basically good, what need is there for the law in it all? In a specific scenario, apply the simple application regarding law with traffic, rather than the more weighty issues of murder and theft. Assume that there were no lines on the road, no stop signs, no traffic lights, no yield or merging signs, etc. Would the basic goodness inherent in man prevail in his driving manner? Or would chaos likely be the result? Naturally, this is a hypothetical scenario that will probably never happen, for no one would dare engage the experiment which suggests a disappointing answer regarding the likely result of such a test. Because man would drive by his preference because that would be his only accessible option. And with no law in existence, there would be no restriction of man's preference. As this application is to traffic, so too would the same result apply to other circumstances. Can we then presume that the laws of traffic provide for righteous drivers? Even with a minor level of consideration, it is evident that the law does not plot a course for the righteous life of man. 
If anything, it serves to identify the unrighteous life of man. The law serves as the restraint against that which our natural tendencies would otherwise prefer. One cannot claim to be righteous because one does not steal someone else's personal property. If one does not steal, one can only rightly claim that one has not been a thief. But not a thief describes only that which one is not, with no reference to what he actually is. A righteous person is more than not a thief, but is righteous in its stead. Then who can claim to be righteous who has sinned? Can the law determine anything but that which is unrighteous? If so, how then could the law direct one to righteousness by decree? In other words, can righteousness be enforced by law? Certainly not, for the law provides for justice through its prescribed punishment, and righteousness, which is Christ Jesus, provides for the eternal life. Herein we are faced with the application of our faith. We actually believe God and act in accordance with that belief, or we believe in God and act in accordance to our own preference. For because of sin, it is impossible for us to make an honest claim that we believe God. If one believes God, one wouldn't sin. Sin isn't believing God, it's believing in oneself. And thus the gift of faith is essentially what places the desires of the spirit against the desires of the flesh. Because faith believes God over oneself. Faith is a gift of honorable relationship with God, the creator, while in faith's absence one is left to one's own preference, which is by and for the creature alone. Hence, through the gift of faith, we can believe God with regard to his graciousness towards us, to whom he has chosen to be gracious, and that by his will and to his purpose, our just wage has been paid to his beloved Son in our stead, so that we are adopted into the inheritance of Christ Jesus, a salvation from the righteous wrath of God and for the eternal blessing of eternal life. As this has been made known to us through the Holy Scripture, or God's Word, is it also what we believe? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and honored and blessed to be chosen by you, to be under your grace, given the faith, so that we may be with you in eternal life. So, Father, we ask as you grant us more and more of this understanding that we might live in that understanding and walk in the Spirit that you have provided for us. We thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.